Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Cloud Security, You're It. My name is Carol Auth of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Roger O'Farrell, SANS instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded, and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Roger. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, introduction and thank you everybody for being here today in this uh, beautiful morning. We're gonna be talking today about uh, cloud security, of course, and the title is Your It, because what I want to talk about is some of you are being thrown out there in the cloud without previous, uh, uh, you know, uh, advice or something and they say hey listen we're going to the cloud i need you to take care of security for us we're going to go ahead and go full sail ahead we're going to need your help and that's kind of the idea here what are you going to do when you're faced in that in that uh, situation where they say yeah you're it you're going to be able to you should be able to secure our cloud um good luck so that's kind of uh, what we're going to center the discussion here today and we're going to talk about uh, why we're here today what's the, the problem that we have in regards to uh, security in the cloud because it's a big one so we're going to want to, want to talk about that we're going to talk about some of the basics that you should be considering as soon as you get access to whatever environment is it that you're going to be responsible for securing we're going to frame our conversation kind of uh, in the aws and azure world AWS, of course, they wrote the book, and uh, Azure has been growing a lot. We'll sprinkle a little bit of, of Google as uh, we can here and there, and then we're going to talk about what, what's next. What are you going to keep doing after you understand your environment? What are some of the things that you should be focusing on as you start that cloud security journey? We're going to show some of the tools that we're going to be talking about, cloud native. We're going to show some examples in Azure, some examples in AWS, and then, of course, uh, like typical uh, um, uh, webcast fashion we're going to go ahead and open the floor for you to ask any questions that you may have and see how we can help uh answer that uh, a little bit about me i'm an information security manager in the financial sector during day my secret identity is a instructor here for sans i do teach the sec 488 cloud essentials class so a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about here is kind of what we cover in, in, in that class. So you, you get an idea if, uh, if you, maybe you have some interest in taking the class or, or if, if it's for you, this is going to help answer that question. So uh, again, we're here because you might be thrown out there in the cloud and, and you have some idea of what you're going to be expecting. You say, oh, this is going to be exciting cloud. This is what everybody's doing. I want to go out there. I want to go do this thing. And it's going to be awesome. And I'm, I'm not saying it's not going to be because, again, some of us have made, made careers out of this and, and we love all this world of uh, cloud security, but uh, we, we have to make sure that we understand what we're walking into. You may have an expectation that it's going to be all awesome and fantastic and, and easy and you know nothing is easy in life, right? <laughs> Especially when we talk about security, by the time we add, we add cloud security on top of that, it's, it's, we, we need to do a lot of work to get there and make sure that we're doing things right. Mm, what we may find, even though your expectation is more of uh, what we have here in the picture, you may find something like this. This is what you're going to find out there. Uh, as soon as you open up uh, your console or, or, or your CLI, whatever you're using to get to your cloud environment, you're going to be able to see that some things might not be as uh, smooth as you may want. And, and I'm just pointing some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Misconfigured buckets, public access, uh, too much access for your users, accounts that are dormant out there doing nothing that have been there forever. Uh, you don't have encryption, you don't have multi-factor, you don't have visibility into what's going on into your cloud environments. These are a lot of the uh, kind of a, a baseline things that a lot of people say they encounter when they just walk into some environment that they have inherited. And 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 the idea of this talk came from an article that I I, I read from uh, Matt Fuller. He's the uh, he created a, a tool called uh, Cloudsploit, which was later on sold to a company called Aqua, that uh, kind of uh, helps you solve all of these problems of detecting what's happening. So so his idea was um, what happens when you inherit an AWS account? 
And I, I, that, that got me thinking, I said, we, we need to spread this message a little bit further out there because there's a lot of us that have been in those shoes. A lot of you might be there right now. And yeah, it helps kind of getting an idea of uh, what are we gonna be looking into? And why are we here? Because of things like these. Um, and, and this next set of slides is just examples of how we have breach after breach. And when we see one breach, there's a, a one more. All of these are fairly new. These are from 2020. These two here are from 2021. Uh, all kinds of things are getting exposed in the cloud. Why? Because it, it's a race. Uh, kind of a, the, the, the title of the, of the talk, you're it. The same way you're in security and you're being told, go ahead and secure all the cloud things, uh, developers have, are being told, go ahead and develop for the cloud. In some companies, it might not be strange to see that a developer has full access to creating code and pushing it and standing systems in the cloud. Some companies are uh, understaffed and they, they do rely on people who may not have a lot of security expertise. That's where some of us are gonna come uh, in and try to solve that problem. So again, for multiple reasons, we have a lot, a lot of breaches of cloud. They're not gonna stop anytime soon. They're not going anywhere. And it's a problem. It's a big problem out there. Not a week goes by that we don't see in the news that something has been exposed. Some of these breaches have been massive. Uh, we've heard breaches from Microsoft related to cloud and basically all kinds of companies. And and let me make a differentiation here. We're, we're, we're talking mostly about issues related to somebody messing something up. Um, if you follow cloud security news, you may have heard that Azure has had a rough month with a whole bunch of vulnerabilities that have been discovered. Um, there was some vulnerability discovered for AWS uh, workspaces recently. We're not talking about those. Those are vulnerabilities that issues that the providers have. But the focus for us today, it's going to be in those um, misconfiguration factors. Some people are doing something wrong, making some mistakes, and kind of creating these uh, massive issues. But taking a look at all the slides that we've been through here with examples of, uh, of uh, breaches, there's a common theme that keeps coming up to the top. And if you take a look at some of the quotes from this uh, set of news, uh, there's something that is going to come a, a lot. It's misconfiguration, misconfiguration, configuration error somebody somewhere it's <laughs> hitting something or making a mistake in the console if you're using infrastructure as code something is wrong somebody is causing that and it's simple what the problem is here it, it it's all of us it's you it's me it's us there's a lot of human component here making mistakes we're not hearing a lot about the providers failing and making massive mistakes and exposing every single customer out there again separate from the vulnerabilities that may have been discovered recently but what we're talking about is that a lot of these breaches are driven by by human error basically somebody's making a mistake and it's all of us so the question for us is okay let's think about this how are we going to attack this and there's one logical step that that is how we're going to to react when we see all of this things happening and it's going to be panicking <laughs> and of course I, i'm being you know a little bit funny here but uh, that happens in some places. Some people do freak out and they don't know what to do. They say, oh my God, we've been exposed, et cetera. And sure, that's a problem. It may mean different things for, for all of you. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if some company says, oh, we're gonna fire the security person. Oh, um, uh, no, it might be an opportunity to invest in more technology to fix the problem, the, the blank check, if. Uh, if you will, that happens in a lot of cases. We've we've seen it after a lot of breaches. So again, just don't panic. <laughs> uh, even though uh, you know I'm saying that's the next step, that's the one that we're not going to do. But we need to do, just take a step back. We need to consider that what can we do here? Again, this is a in big part of people problem. Is it's not much of a it's part of process also because um, we may not have the right. Um, um, controls to make sure that we're not making those mistakes, but it's going to start with people. So that's the way that we're going to solve it. We need, we need to take a break. We need to take a deep breath. We need to understand. Uh, let's go back to the basics. Let, let's start from zero and how we're going to be approaching this problem. And no cloud discussion would be complete without putting this slide, right? The share responsibility. It's kind of mandatory that we have to throw it in there. And, and uh, I always make the joke of, um, 
of it, it being mandatory, but here's what I always put it in because there's still a little bit of misconception in 2021 about who's going to take care of what in the cloud. We have a lot of people that, that are new to the cloud and this message has to be sent because it's going to set the tone of how we're going to move forward securing our environments. The idea being that the security of the cloud is something that the provider is going to take care of. Remember, they have the physical servers, the big data center with the, the defenses, the, 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 the guards, the cameras, all of that. That is, that is the foundation of what the cloud is, the essence, the fabric. That is what the provider is going to be taking care of. For us, as cloud consumers, we are responsible for the security in the cloud. So again, every single thing that you put out there on a provider, it's going to be your responsibility. If you deploy a VPC, you have to secure that VPC. If you deploy um, EC2s or VMs, depending on the provider, you have to secure that. Do not expect those to be secured by, by, by magic or anything like that. Uh, functions, Lambdas, Azure functions, all of that stuff. We are responsible for securing every single component that we are creating in our cloud, databases, you name it. You, you know all the things that are get deployed out there. And, and more so the data, that's the big thing here. We have to make sure that we're protecting data, we follow that data wherever it goes, and that we're building controls around that data. Here, here uh, some people say, oh, that defense in depth idea, it's kind of uh, old. And I would say, no, that's not the case. We need redundancies. If one control fails, we should have another one. Again, it's all about staying outside of the news and making sure that uh, we're not one of those with the breaches and you got somebody knocking on your virtual door saying, hey, did you know that you were exposing A, B, C, or D? That, that, that's gonna be a problem. So a common thing that I hear people say is, uh, listen, uh, what do I need to do to start? And one of those first things is going to be making sure that you understand what's out there in your environment and what your environment looks like. Some people say, oh, but, I know a little bit about GCP, I know a little bit about uh, AWS, and now they're throwing me into Azure. I don't know what, what's going on here. How, how do I kind of uh, make those connections? Uh, and that's what I mean by I only speak cloud vendor. Uh, every vendor right now, at, at least whoever's trying to compete with AWS, because again, AWS has wrote the book on the cloud. There's no denying that. But we have here Google on the left and we have Azure on the right. And they're putting guidance out there saying, hey, listen, if you are coming from that world, my uh, computing service is called VMs. It's not EC2, but Azure calls it uh, EC2. Google does the same thing. So we can compare apples to apples. I mean, that doesn't work that way in every single case, but for the key components of uh, every cloud provider, you're going to be able to kind of match services one-to-one, -one, computing, networking, firewalls, uh, WAFs, whatever that is, there's going to be some sort of equivalent. So one of the big things is understand that um, there might be a little bit of nuances to the implementation of the concepts, but if you know something about some cloud provider, most likely the same thing is going to extend in some way to the other. So don't, don't worry about that. It's just about finding what's different. Moving on about um, understanding more about your environment, one of the things that you have to do is check what documentation exists out there. Uh, don't be surprised if you come to this, a blank page, because there's no documentation. I, I've been in that, in that place more than once. Early in my career, I went to a lot of places that uh, they said, Doc, Doc, what? what is that documentation thing that you talk about? It's uh, something that uh, doesn't happen. It, it's one of two things that I would see. Either there's no documentation or it's uh, 2000, it was 2000, now 21, and the documentation is from 2010. And of course, it's pre cloud, nothing translates. Um, it happens more than, than we should care about. But again, it doesn't hurt checking. You might get lucky and you may find that somebody before you did a good job and kind of documented uh, what the environment looks like. The other thing that I would say here is, if you come into that blank page situation where there's nothing, please do your homework. Don't be that person who's gonna perpetuate that problem. Go ahead and create some documentation. Even if it's some simple uh, network diagram, I mean, this might not be so simple if you're new to <laughs> some of these things, but at least having some sort of a diagram of what is in use, what uh, technologies, 
cloud services exist out there? How is the connectivity coming in? Um, yeah, what do you have? That's going to be a lot of value. And there's no excuse nowadays to not create this. Again, not something you would do immediately, immediately when you start you know, running and trying to figure out what's going on. But after you kind of get your bearings right, go ahead and take some time and make sure that you're creating some documentation. Uh, there's tools like Cloud Mapper that can help you figure out what's in your environment. That one is AWS specific, but it's been around for a while. It can help you map your network. It can help you uh, kind of identify some issues that you may have. The tool kind of evolved from just being a, a network mapping thing, and now it's more of a, an assessment tool. If, uh, but also keeping in the line of uh, creating documentation, there's some some uh, tools like Lucid Chart. They have a free version. They have uh, premium versions uh, that can go ahead and help you document what your environments look like. So do make sure, please, that you are doing your little part to make sure that everything is uh, properly documented. So assuming uh, you either found documentation or were able to find out how to create some of that, the next thing that you can start looking into, it's gonna be how are your accounts set up in whatever provider you live in? And you may say, hey, Raj, well, why do I care about accounts? And the answer is simple. Accounts are going to be um, logical boundaries. That's how we should see them. They're going to help us they're going to help us take control of uh, d different things. For example, we have the idea in the cloud of blast radius uh, containment. If something gets compromised, we're pointing down here to our child accounts, down there at that level at the bottom, well, something here in another level should not, in theory, be compromised because you have the right logical separation. And it would not be such a trivial task for an attacker to kind of try to jump from one account to another. Ideally, again, you're using those accounts as that logical separation that's going to allow you to, to create some barriers. And that's all that we're looking to do here in the cloud, create as many barriers as we can for attackers without, of course, affecting uh, the day-to-day -day work. So um, that this is kind of what that would look like in um, AWS, but every single provider out there kind of has the same idea. We're talking about Azure. They have the idea of uh, subscriptions uh, right here at the bottom, and that's going to be your your kind of a way that you're going to segment off your your workloads. You can have like Dev, uh, Prod, QA, Test, however you want to go ahead and divide those. Maybe you have like a separate little lab account that doesn't have access to much but understanding how those are set up in your environment it's going to be one one big aspect worst case there's no segmentation then you can say okay we should be subdividing this and creating sub accounts to make sure that uh, nobody can move from from the non-production environments to production uh, in, a, in a trivial manner so think about that again Google does the same thing. They have the idea of uh, projects and they, they can help create that separation and you can build uh, controls around that, okay? Now, what else can we do? The next step is going to be finding your doors. And what I mean by doors is any way that um, anybody can come into your environment. Failing to do this, it's it, it's bad because imagine if uh, you build a bank and you build a vault and you have a big door with the uh, fancy log that's timed and all of that and biometrics and whatever, but there's a door in the back that nobody knows about that leads to an alley and it's unlocked 24 seven. So that is what I mean here by find your doors. Uh, the root account is one of those things that has a lot, a lot of power in whatever provider you live in. When I say here, please know that means do not use your root account for basically anything. It should be a break the glass in case of emergency type. It's when you have exhausted all ways to go into your uh, account, um, then you would use a root account. But you should not be using that, that for daily activities. Uh, don't assign programmatic access. Uh, it should be something you go through the console and when you need it and you have the password in some sort of vault and that's it. But again, should not be used for day-to-day uh, -day activities. Something you should be monitoring. We'll talk more about logging and monitoring coming up here in a couple of slides. But that is one of your biggest doors. Make sure that you protect that. The other uh, scenario, you have a Bastion host. 
um, some people may call it a jump host. It's the idea of this hardened uh, workstation in your cloud environment, EC2, VM, whatever you want to call it, and in whatever provider you live in, that it's hardened. It should be doing one thing and one thing only, and it's jumping in from the outside into your environment, and then from there you move on inside your cloud environment. Uh, do not use that for anything else. I have seen Bastion hosts that, I mean, they, they stop being Bastion hosts because people decide to host FTP websites, weird things that you should not be doing. The only purpose of this workstation is to be able to get in. I Usually it's, we're talking about something like SSH. Of course, here the usual advice applies. Make sure that you're doing um, key pairs, not passwords, those are, you know, you're going to keep somebody banging at that door 24 seven. If you have passwords, somebody may get lucky at some point. So don't do that. Um, access keys, your users, users may have access keys that allow them all kinds of access. Um, and, and remember at the beginning, we said that over provisioning, it's one of the big issues that we have. We also talk more about that coming up. Um, admin interfaces, uh, people stand all kinds of services in the cloud, Kubernetes and Elastic and you name it. And sometimes they expose things that um, have, a, have a lot of power. There's a, a, a case that we talk about in, in, in SEC 488 about Tesla being compromised because a Kubernetes uh, console was exposed out there to the public. There was some crypto mining and some shenanigans that happened. So that that is what I mean by make sure that you uh, protect your admin interfaces. After that, it's kind of the idea of what I call finding your north. It's like, what else is out there? Let's look in every single direction. And and um, some people may say, and here the first one is evaluate your regions. Because a case that I've seen in, in companies that are starting to go to the cloud is they, okay, we're going to live in one region. I don't know, US East one, for to throw an example out there in AWS. And they're going to go ahead and they're going to build a lot of monitoring, a lot of things in that region, forgetting that somebody somewhere, maybe my mistake, is spinning up resources in some other region. Again, if you have built your monitoring just too tight and circumscribed to a region, you're never going to see that activity. So think about what's out there, regions, VPCs, security groups, all those things are going to be key to understanding uh, what sort of uh, movement can happen from one place to another. Security groups been the big one here. Remember, they're going to live closer to our uh, computing, Lambda functions, EC2s, uh, VMs, if you're talking about Azure. Uh, think about what ports might be exposed out there. If uh, you have something like allowing traffic from 000 from basically everyone, you may want to circumscribe that to some specific IPs. And that might be a little bit difficult to maintain, but again, you have to balance the risk with the potential benefit that you can get. But the idea is make sure that you're accounting again for every single way that you can go into your environments. And after you do that, consider everywhere that you may live inside that environment. Now, one more thing that we should be considering is to help us understand our environment, it's going to be tags. And this is something like, this is an extension to me of documentation. You may be unlucky and nobody tagged anything, or you may get lucky and you may see something like the example here at the top. This is, uh, you can see the tags here in Azure. We put a cost center tag. We have a tag that says uh, what department owns that. Is this a production or, or test or whatever? Uh, we have the owner here. Tags are super helpful. What you can do, and what I'm showing here in my scratchy handwriting, <laughs> this is supposed to be a quarantine tag. What you can do is, if you're doing some sort of incident investigation, um, you can go ahead and tag that as being quarantined. Why does that matter? Because then you can build a whole bunch of automation based off tags. These are attributes that are going to move uh, and live, I should say, with whatever resource it is. Uh, VMs can be tagged, network security groups, anything these days can be tagged. And yeah, you can go ahead and do a lot of good stuff with automation and command line to get to query those uh, resources based on that. And then like I also said, automation, that's gonna help you um, kind of trigger different things based off that. At the bottom, of course, we have an example for AWS. We have the idea of a ticket ID tag that points out to a change request that uh, is related to that asset. So again, you he, here the options are endless. 
Now, ideally, the tax is something that is not solely for the security function, but um, like I said here, cost center at the top. Yeah, finance one two knows about that, especially if you're doing chargebacks and you have to make sure that you they charge to whoever owns that resource. But we in security can leverage all that. But there has to be an understanding across the company of how they're going to be used. So so they can they, they it's not solely a secure a security function. So do keep that in mind. From there, we move on to talk about some tools in our cloud environments that we can help kind of uh, do all the things that I mentioned, how we can find out what's exposed, the, the doors, how we can exp uh, find out our assets and all of that. And that is that is what this next section is going to talk about. In AWS, we have uh, IIM, Identity and Access Management. It has a few things that are going to be able to, to provide us, um, yeah, tooling uh, to do that. In this example, what we have is the idea of an access analyzer. What this service does is uh, kind of let us know, hey, listen, you have some things out there that are exposed to the outside. In the example there at the bottom, you have a resource, which is a, a bucket. And if you take a, a name, at the, a look at the name of the bucket, it's sensitive. And there on the right, it's telling you, hey, there's public read access. So that can be a problem. Again, you have to put two and two together. Sensitive bucket, public read access, that to me screams uh, it's really bad. So tooling like this, it's going to allow you to see what potential holes you may have. If you have other AWS accounts that have some sort of access into your environment, you can also go ahead and look at those here. So it's going to give you at least something to start looking at and understand what it's potentially exposed out there. We'll see a little bit more of this uh, when we uh, go into the um, the demo coming up here. AWS Config, it, it's not a security service per se, but um, it's kind of a management tool, but look at what it can do. Resource inventory, That that is one of those things that we have been saying forever. You might be familiar with the critical controls. Control one and two say, take control of your hardware and assets. That is what we're talking about here. We need to make sure that we understand what we have out there in our cloud environment. Otherwise, there's no way that we can protect any of that if we don't know it, it, it exists. Example, you may, you may know that there's EC2s, and sure, you know about those. You have protections that, that, that you have built around those. But at some point, somewhere, somebody's going to get creative. They're going to start messing with, I don't know, Kubernetes or containers and all that stuff. and by looking at your inventory, you're gonna know that that's something that you never seen before, and that should come up on your radar and say, hold on, how come now we're seeing containers if we have never done anything? Again, somebody got creative, they want to innovate, <laughs> whatever, and I'm not saying, let's say no, I don't, I, I don't wanna be the no police, but we have to make sure that whoever's doing that is doing it in a safe manner. Understanding what inventory we have, it's gonna be a key thing right there, and if we see something that we never seen before pop up here, something that has to be questioned and, and make sure that there's enough control that are going to satisfy whatever the risk appetite for our um, company is going to be. So again, very good tool, config. We'll see more coming up here in a minute. Another tool that's also going to help us is gonna be Security Hub. Security Hub is that, that place that's going to help us see how are we doing re in, in relation to best practices. Uh, we have examples here of PCI, the foundational best practices from AWS, the CIS, and we get the idea of a security score. It's gonna give us some recommendations. Again, if you're coming into an account, this is one of those places that you have to look, and it's gonna point out some things that might be bad. I'm not saying everything is going to be bad. Again. All of you may have different risk appetites. So think about that. We'll see some of that coming up here in a second. Our friends on the Microsoft side, they have the same idea. Here we're looking at uh, the concept of inventory. We're seeing all the resources that we have. We see that we have seven unhealthy resources. You may want to focus your attention on those at the very beginning to see how you can fix that. We'll also get to examine the idea of the security score coming up um, once we go into the console, but it's kind of the same tool as Security Hub where you can get a lot of insight into how you can improve your environment and take a look at those things that might be bad or really, really bad. All right, so after we talk about this, we have to talk about logging and monitoring. 
Um, you understand what you have out there. You did your inventory. You checked your best practices. You did what you can to align to those. Sure. What's going to be next is we, we have to make sure that we're logging and monitoring our systems. But this is something that requires a little bit of exercise in, in, in how we're going to be doing it, come up with some sort of strategy. Um, what data sources are we going to be bringing in? Uh, some, some, some services tell us a, a part of the equation. Some logs tell us a part of the equation. We'll talk more about that. Uh, is it real time that's needed? Cloud, tra cloud trails is delayed. You may want to think about what you're going to do with that. Uh, storage, where are we going to throw the, the logs? How long are we going to retain them? If we're talking about multi-cloud, that equation kind of gets a little bit more complex. In those cases, you may want the idea of a one-stop shop, one place where you can see your logs. Of course, that's a little bit more advanced, but those are things that you have to think up front because they're going to shape that conversation of how we're going to be managing logs. And this, the solution is going to be very different if you're living in one provider versus if you live in two or more. So do think about that. Talking about AWS, one of the key things, we have to make sure that CloudTrail is enabled. That is that service that's going to allow us to track every single API call that happens within our environment. It, it, it does just that, just grab those and put them somewhere. It could, let's say you send them to an S3 bucket. The problem is that that is not immediately actionable. Yeah, you have them and you can check a box somewhere and some compliance thing saying, yeah, I'm logging, but are you monitoring? Not really. To do that, you need to make sure that you enable services like CloudWatch, kind of an observability platform. Instead of just having the raw logs, now you can start to parse them and understand what they are. And you can create metrics, alarms. If you see this X amount of times, trigger something, trigger an alarm, uh, send me an email. We can go ahead and use those triggers as automation. Well, if you see somebody that's uh, knocking on my door and they fail three times or something like that, go ahead and kick off this other action that's going to, I don't know, the world is, an, is your oyster right there. You can automate anything. Um, you can send uh, some triggers to a Lambda function that's going to trigger all kinds of things. So the idea being you can throw, you can throw all your logs at CloudWatch. You can centralize them from different accounts. You can make sense of what they are. Again, metrics, uh, make them actionable, which is uh, one of the key things that um, we're looking to do. And again, this is all natively. We haven't talked about third-party things at all or anything like that here. Sure, as you mature in your log uh, uh, quest, you may get into something more complicated like what you see here in this slide. This is basically a, a log ingestion pipeline. You see there's a, uh, logs coming from different accounts. They're going through different things. There, there's a Lambda there in the middle. Uh, there's the idea of uh, throwing them into Elasticsearch. Then you can go ahead and have uh, dashboards and visuals, which are going to help you understand what's going on. So, of course, here there's a component that security can benefit from. I don't know, maybe you have something on, on premise that your people know and use some sort of seam or something like that. It may make sense in some cases to throw those logs into whatever local seam you may have. And some people may say, hey, Raj, that doesn't make any sense, uh, bringing logs from the cloud to on premise. And ideally, you would do everything in the cloud, but think about this. Most likely, your people, your engineers, your analysts, your SOC, they have spent a lot of time and your company has spent a lot of money training those people. And they're really, really good at whatever team product you want to insert here. Yeah, it's going to make some sense to bring those logs from the cloud into that product, assuming it's supported, because your people know how to use it. That's going to be better, and it's going to uh, put you in a better uh, uh, position to defend your cloud than if you want to spend now four months training your people in something else. So think about that. There's not one solution here, but um, yeah, different approaches for sure. On the Azure side, there's a lot of guidance, and I mean, I'm using Azure here as an example, but every provider has out there guides on this. These are some of the things that we think you should be doing to log and monitor in the, the right way. So make sure you're looking at what that is. Make sure that it's uh, you're following those practices in your environments because, uh, again, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot, a lot of guidance out there. So don't be intimidated if you walk into some environment and you say, like, what am I going to do? No, again, the guidance is going to be out there. And, and one thing to mention here, uh, what I would say about Azure, when I say ensure the logs are being collected and monitored also, 
I'll show you, I'll point some things out when we go here into the console, but Azure tends to log less by default than AWS. In some places, you're gonna turn some things on. I'll show you what that looks like in a moment here. After you do all that, don't forget that you need to be able to lock down your environment. There's a lot of things happening out there that we have to be cognizant of and identifying things is just half the equation. The other one is make sure that you lock it down. Uh, account for privilege usage, uh, access usage. The root account we talked about, on use accounts, this is a big one. I was reading an article a couple of months ago about this lady, I can't remember if it, where it was, but it was for a credit union. She was fired and two days later she logged on and deleted, I don't know how many gigs of data. Uh, yeah, termination processes right there, didn't work. Uh, why is an account alive after somebody quit? It's one of those things that we should have solved, I don't know, in the 90s or something like that, <laughs> but it's still happening nowadays. So we have to make sure that account or, accounts that are not being used just get killed with fire. Something that we have to do. Um, best practices, this may sound like something, you, oh, Raj, here we go again. This is the things that we keep hearing over and over and over. But again, people fail at these things. So we feel like we're obligated to mention them. Multi-factor being one of those. Uh, I, I read something from Twitter the other day that I think less than 10% of uh, Twitter accounts have uh, uh, multi-factor enabled. Um, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done uh, there. Um, least privilege, that's another big one. Uh, if anybody has been doing IT as long as I have, you may remember the days when you wanted to bring some piece of technology into your company and the vendor would say, yeah, I need a service account to run my, my app in your environment and I need domain admin access just to make sure that just to make sure we don't have any problems. And do you want to give domain access to uh, some account that's going to be sending faxes or something like that? Not really. The same thing applies here. Assign just the access that you need and nothing else. It's really easy to say, oh, let me give them admin access or let me give them access to all of EC2 or, or all of S3. It happens. It happens because uh, people take shortcuts, but we have to make sure that we are assigning just the access that uh, that's needed. Uh, you should be looking at something like the IAM credential report. What this is gonna do is let you know all the users that you have out there, and it's gonna give you some good information about when the user account was created, uh, when was the password last used, when were the access keys last used? Because then you can say, okay, this user created six months ago, has never logged on, has never logged on with a password, has never logged on with access keys. I mean, this account doesn't need to be there. Most likely that's going to be the case. So it's gonna be one of those things that uh, it's going to help you do something, uh, at, at least get, get see what's, um, how you can do something better. Access advisor also, it's gonna, we're gonna take a look at this. It's gonna point out access that might not be used that you could potentially kill. We also have things like a trusted advisor that it's gonna point out things that need to be corrected. We talk about security groups that may need some tightening, bucket permissions, big things that need to be uh, kind of fixed. Again, so you're not one of those at the beginning of the, of the talk that are, are having some issues and exposing things out there. And, and also I always uh, say, let, let, let's take care of the basics, you know, the providers are helping us, putting guidance and saying, hey, these are the things that you should be doing. You might be familiar with the well-architected framework in AWS, the reference architectures from Azure. They all talk about security, about the things that we should be doing from an IAM perspective, from, from basically everything. Make sure that you're looking at those. Third parties that have no vested interest in any of these providers, CIS, the Center for Internet Security, Cloud Security Alliance, both are doing great taking a look at um, also guidance on what you should be doing. Now we have frameworks that are starting to, to realize that cloud is a problem and they're um, adding uh, guidance that is very specific to cloud. So look at those too. If you're in the government sector, you have the SRG, the STIGs, if you, you know what I'm talking about. If you live in that, in that space, you have CMMC guidance, all those things that the government does, FedRAM, you name it. Uh, Make sure that you look at all that documentation to, again, take care of the basics because, again, somewhere, somewhere, somebody is failing at taking care of these things. 
So last slide before we do a quick uh, look at the console here. If you want more, you have to consider what's out there that's native from a security perspective that's going to help you. We have things like guard duty for, for threat detection, inspector to take a look at vulnerabilities, detective if you want to investigate your incidents. On the Azure side, you have Sentinel, kind of the, the their SIEM offering, Key Vault in, uh, to protect your keys, information protection to follow your data. So there's going to be a lot of solutions in every provider to make sure that uh, you kind of enhance your security journey as you mature in the cloud. At some point, those tools may not be a good fit for you. That's why we have, I'm calling out some good examples on the right side of uh, kind of people that have been doing some good stuff on the cloud, Aqua, I said uh, earlier they bought uh, the cloud exploit. They they got they in, in Prisma too. They're gonna give you that single uh, pane of glass view if you live in a multi-cloud environment. We have tools like Datadog that are becoming really popular out there. Lacework. Um, all these tooling tool sets are doing a lot of things, especially as you go to more complex environments. You start adding things like a lot of functions, a lot of containers, Kubernetes, all that you're going to mature to a point where you may need to bring some third party tools. But again, my advice is always look at what your provider is giving you. That usually works if you're if you're starting out. Don't just blindly go out buying things. You may realize at some point, hey, listen, we have some issues here. We need to go ahead and see how some other providers can help us in this space, right? So with that, what I'm gonna do here is just, um, let me swap to my console here to point out a couple of things that I want you, I wanna make sure that everybody takes uh, with you. One of those things is going to be going to um, IIM and kind of pointing out some of the things that uh, we talk about. Let me, let me swap out my video here so we get a little bit more real estate. Look at this. When you go to your console, it's going to say, hey, listen, you have some issue that you have to fix right now. You need to put multi-factor. I see that you were able to set it up for the root account, but the user that you're using right now does not have that. Something that you may want to take a look at. Another thing, take a look at your users. Right here, what we see that we have a number of users, and and again, this is overly simplified on purpose, so you can kind of see the value. Don't expect to go to your account and just find a couple of users. Some people may have hundreds, thousands. Hopefully, if that's the case, you're doing something like federation. But I understand again that in some environment, this is how it would go. What you could see here, it's um, kind of a notice here in the middle. We have like three Rachel Greens um, with kind of uh, spelling variations and your eye should immediately immediately go here to last activity never so we have two accounts there that had never logged on and nothing has been done with those the other one has logged on two days ago my conclusion here is okay somebody kind of fat finger something they created uh two wrong users and again they're dormant out there doing nothing so just by going here and looking at the last activity you can see that they haven't done anything. And yes, you can tell that I have a slight obsession with the show Friends. So we have Ross Geller and Rachel Green. And before you ask, yes, they were on a break. <laughs> so again, you can start looking at some of that activity and see what's going on um, there. Here tells you a quick picture. Yeah, you can see what's going on. But in some cases, it might not be evident. So you need to dig a little bit deeper. The other thing that we talked about was the idea of the access um, analyzer. And again, this is pointing out that you have some resource that, that's out there exposed. You're going to go ahead and be able to explore what that is. Look at the big massive warning. It's telling you, hey, you have some public access. You may want to take some action. At the bottom, it's going to give you some guidance. If this access is an intended and you accept it and you risk accept it, yeah, let's go ahead and archive um, that finding. It, it, almost, it also lets you create like an automatic thing. So if it gets detected in the future, um, you can go ahead and, and suppress it, or if it's not intended, it's going to give you some guidance on how to fix it. So no excuse for us not to be fixing any of these issues. The other one I'm going to pivot quickly here and point out, it's going to be config, which is that, um, that idea of what's out there in your environment. Here again, we see that we have uh, some IAM roles. We have seven buckets. We have six users, subnet security groups. EC2 volumes, good, good place to kind of understand everything that you have out there. For example, one thing that I love about config, it's if I want to take a look at one of my security groups, 
I can see kind of uh, what they have been up to. So I'm just going to pick one here that I know has something that it's going to be of value to me. And this is my allow 443 only role. And what you can do here is uh, this idea of the resource timeline. You can see how that resource has changed um, throughout time. Let me filter by config and look at the beauty here. You can go ahead and see that at some point in time uh, in sep on September 20, well, yeah, yesterday, there was a mistake here. This was allowing port 80 and that was not allowed port 443. So what this is telling you here is that there was a config change from allowing port 80. We went to removing that. So now this resource, it is really allowed for port 443 only. We also see that from having no tags, we added a tag here um, with the key name and the value allow 443. So imagine if uh, for like, if you're investigating an incident or something, you can go back here and see what changed, when it changed and who affected that change. So it's a, it's a, it's a great thing to, to keep in mind. Uh, we also have the idea of conformance packs. Um, what this is, is kind of different rule sets, if you will. If we go here to using templates, you can see what they cover. Um, oops, that went away kind of too quick. Whatever it is it that you're looking to do, if you have best practices for S3, if you live in the government world, there's a CMMC, there's NIST, FedRAMP, uh, you name it, there's something here, there's little different sets of, uh, of rule sets, if you will, that are going to allow you to align to those different frameworks. So again, this is something that you would do after you take care of all the basics that we sort of mentioned. So now from that, we're gonna go ahead and pivot to the Azure side, where um, the, the, the one that I wanna point out right away is gonna be uh, Security Center. It's kind of the security hub equivalent, remember what I said before, that a lot of these services do similar things and they just, in, in essence, do the exact same thing and they just have a little bit of different uh, secret sauce. As you can see, similar to Security Hub, we have the idea of uh, security scores, we have uh, compliance uh, aspects, also really, really helpful if you have to adhere to some of those frameworks that we, we mentioned. If we dive a little bit deeper into our security score, uh, we, got to, we have to go into our subscription here and kind of see what's going on. We're getting a score of 55%. So we have we have a lot of room to improve here. That's uh, that's something uh, good down. Uh, down here, it tells you an idea of what are the things that you need to be looking at. Um, look at the potential score increase column right here. That means that by fixing that issue that appears in, in, in red on the right side, you, you can go up 16%. For example, expand to secure management ports. It's gonna tell you some of the things you have to uh, be doing. Uh, that means, hey, listen, you need to make sure that you are um, protecting your ports. It's internet facing, go ahead and close them. If you uh, go ahead and expand on one of those, it's gonna tell you, okay, this is the resource that has the issue. And this is how you would fix it. Again, it's going to give you, it's going to give you some uh, steps on how you can fix that. And yeah, notice it's going to take a little bit of time to kind of reevaluate that. But uh, the next, but the next time you maybe check in a day or so, everything is going to be fixed. But uh, guidance again, if you don't know what to do, the guidance is going to be there. In some cases, you might be able to even trigger automatic uh, fixing of issues. So that is a great, great feature. And let me dive into one more uh, before we go into uh, Q&A. The last thing that I want to point out is what I mentioned before about logging. A lot of logging, it's not enabled by default. In this example here, we have two Windows VMs and we have one uh, Linux going on here. What you're going to see is if you dive into um, what's called the diagnostic settings, and we're going to go here to these are called blades, you know, your settings blade, um, there's a monitoring blade down here, and there's this idea of diagnostic settings, right? And notice what we're saying here. These are host level metrics, CPU utilization, disk network, and basically everything that lives inside the VM. What that means, because I don't have it enabled, is that I'm not capturing logs right now of what's happening inside my VM. 
you would need to go ahead and say enable that the guest level monitoring to make sure that you're capturing those logs and i'm going to pivot here to my vm01 which does have that turned on and here now you see it's a little bit different it says hey listen right right now you're collecting cpu memory disk network and this is the stuff that we normally care about if we have like an on-premise seam most likely you're sending these logs there, your security, your application and your system and something else that you may have, uh, Sysmon, things like that. And here's an idea of uh, how you can kind of customize what you are collecting. Again, this is talking to an agent on those uh, uh, VMs. Oh, oh, sorry, had a little bit of a <laughs> uh, wrong click right there. But yeah, you can customize what's happening here. For example, if you want to also log the audit success, you can go ahead and trigger that. If you don't care about the warnings, you can kind of uh, uh, remove that. And yeah, that's going to talk to the agent on that VM. One thing to point out is that this diagnostic setting applies throughout a whole bunch of different things within Azure. And it's going to change depending on the context of whatever asset you're dealing with. I'm going to switch now to my uh, Linux here so you can see how it's going to be a little bit different. Now we have syslog because that's something that's normal in those environments in, in, in that operating system. And you have uh, even more options to kind of massage what level you're going to be uh, collecting. If you want to change your cron jobs, uh, the level of logging, you can go ahead and change that. So that's the idea. You can go ahead and, 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 and think about anything. If you have a web application firewall, that doesn't log a lot by default. You have to go into the diagnostic settings for that uh, a web application firewall and make sure that you say, I want to log uh, you know, uh, the, the URLs that are being hit, the path, uh, everything that's happening. So always look for that diagnostic tab to make sure that whatever you have going on has enhanced logging. That might be um, satisfy whatever needs you may have, okay? So with that, I hope this has been of value for you. Again, the idea here is that if you're walking into some sort of environment that you're not sure what's going on and what you should be focusing on, that's the idea behind here. Again, take a brief pause, look at what's happening, and make sure that you you understand the environment first before you do anything else, and then start with the basics. That's that that's where a lot of people keep failing, and that's the, mes the message that I want to um, put out there for you. With that, let's go ahead and see if uh, we have any questions uh, that we can answer for you. All right, thanks for that great presentation. Uh, we do have a question in the Q&A window. However, if anyone has any questions, please send them in now. And this one asks, what would you say are the important things to consider when mitigating something on something on-prem to cloud? So if I if I understand the question, are we talking about maybe an attack that is pivoting from on-premise to to cloud? That that is that is something I, I'm going to approach the question from two angles. That's the first. The first one would be if that's the intent. That that means that we have to have solid monitoring in both places because when you have uh, if you have your on-premise, you're in that hybrid environment 24/7. Anything that you do on each side can potentially affect the other. Somebody compromises on premise and you have, I don't know, VPN or express route, direct connect, some sort of connection that's 24 seven going out there. Yeah, you basically have a path for things to jump from one side to another. The cloud is just an extension of your network. The key thing there is gonna be making sure that um, you understand the use cases, what are the paths where uh, attackers could pivot and again, you have monitoring on the um, on-premise side, monitoring on the cloud side. And then we're looking, this is where, what I mentioned before, something like uh, an on-premise seam may make a lot of sense because you can mash all of those environments together and have one place where uh, that, that could happen. If you are in a stage, the other approach I wanted to take of that you're considering going hybrid, uh, then do consider all of that how we're we going to account for those paths of, of moving data. So it, again, not an easy thing, but if you have the chance to do it before that happens, do account for all of that. All right, thanks. Another one came in. It says, do we need to have formally agreed shared responsibility agreements with the CSPS? 
So, so the problem that we have with the cloud providers nowadays, and I'm, I'm going to speak generally here about the big three, Google, Amazon, and Azure, is that the average consumer does not have any leverage to negotiate much. They're going to give you some blanket agreement, and they're going to say, this is what we do. Uh, take it or leave it. <laughs> it's a sad reality. Uh, unless you're a big, massive company, like, for example, anybody may have heard about the JEDI project from the Department of Defense, where they wanted to, to take, a, I think it was a $10 billion contract over 10 years. So when you're spending all that much money, you might be in a position to influence contracts and all that. But at least the big three providers, there's not going to be a lot of flexibility. Again, it's something that we cover in SEC 488 because it's, it's a question that comes out a lot. Where you're going to have more flexibility, it's going to be when we talk about something like SaaS providers. Uh, you're selecting some small service that does one thing, like a one-trick pony. <laughs> uh, you need a tool to do task management or something like that, or you need to, a tool to uh, do whatever, uh, appointments, uh, calendar management or something like that. Yeah, those companies might be smaller, you might be in a better position to negotiate, but again, my my experience out there is going to be that in most cases, you have to take what the provider uh, gives you, and they're going to say, these are our SLAs, this is what we're going to do. But your responsibility as a consumer, make sure that you ask questions. Uh, I don't know, maybe you get lucky and they say, sure, come aboard, and if you sign an NDA and whatnot, we're going to give you a little bit more information. But negotiating uh, terms might not be a thing that a lot of us might be in a good position to do at this point. All right, thanks. Uh, for the security controls offered and managed by CSP, how do we define the security SLAs? Um, that that uh, that is going to be a lot. In a lot of cases, the part that they take care of, like I said, it's going to be spelled out in the contract. For after that, the side that we control is going to be on us to kind of create what those are. Um, something that I always recommend know how to escalate to the provider. Uh, there's a lot of cases out there that are documented that um, companies got compromised and they didn't have solid processes to involve the, the provider. It's gonna be in their best interest to help you out. So that may look different. Again, that's why they offer things like uh, enhanced support plans where they going to guarantee that somebody's gonna get to your issue quicker. So depending on what you need, you're Kind of risk appetite and what kind of support you expect to have from the provider you might be best served by going to one of those paid um, uh, support programs if you if you want immediate service you mean you get the higher tiers where you get assigned an account manager you have different paths to go about support so it's all going to depend on or, or, or what what does it look like for you uh, the risk appetite what your threat model is what do you expect to happen uh, when an attack happens but again, all good questions that should be answered beforehand. All right, thank you. In a multi-cloud environment, how lengthy and difficult is the learning curve for a person new to the organization? It's, it's a little bit harder because now you have those nuances that I mentioned about. It's, it's a little bit more challenging. There's no, no easy way to put it. Especially if you're coming to an environment that doesn't have mature tooling set, tool sets, I should say, in place. Uh, some of those vendors that I mentioned, and there's a whole bunch of excellent ones that just didn't have a, a lot of space in the slide. There's a lot of vendors that specialize in solving that problem, multi-cloud. And we're going to go ahead and take care of your workloads. Doesn't matter where they are. We're going to take care of your compliance. Doesn't matter where it is. And we're seeing more and more of that. So doing it natively, my it's it's gonna be it's gonna be harder if you're trying to do that with your own stuff. We're gonna see some services like Sentinel says that they can take AWS logs, um, and and I would see more of that because the providers understand that what happens in a, a lot of cases is that you live in one environment and then you have maybe. I'm gonna call it a rogue business unit <laughs> because I don't have a better word, that they want to do something, uh, maybe they understand Azure better and they wanna go that way or they understand Google. And it's a challenge for security. We, we are going to be in charge of finding out how to solve that problem. And like I said, we may need to do some, some, some behind the scenes magic, some automation to do some lock shipping from one place to another. 
But the key thing is going to be making sure we have somebody who understands the nuances of that other provider and, and kind of how it compares to what the, the other provider is. So provider one and provider two, if we're talking about events, how, how the fields that are contained in those logs kind of map to the other one. Like I said, that problem has been solved with a lot of third-party products. So if you're in that environment, it's something you may want to look into. All right, thanks. Uh, what are the different types of security SLAs which we need to consider? And, and that is going to depend, like I said, we're talking from the provider perspective. Uh, it's going to depend on, on, on how you expect your provider to respond. And yeah, they're giving you options. Like I said, we go back to the support levels. Uh, they have different tiers. If you pay them X amount of money, I can't remember off the top of my head what those are, but yeah, they kind of sign resources to you. They have somebody who can help you respond quicker. Uh, from inside your company, that's a, that's an exercise of, uh, of risk. We have to answer uh, the question internally, how risky is this? If we're talking about um, something like exposed buckets, yeah, that's something that I would expect a high severity. If you have sensitive data, let me qualify that. Sometimes you have exposed buckets that have marketing websites with public data. That's not risky. That's uh, again, what you have to understand what it is, what is the resource, what is the use. And then from that, you have to kind of uh, carve your own path internally and kind of get agreement with your stakeholders of how important resources are because the response is going to depend on, on that. We wouldn't, we wouldn't trigger the same response. Again, if a, if a resource with non-sensitive data gets exposed versus somebody that's holding uh, your finance data or your employees' uh, personal identifiable information. So it, it's all about an exercise of uh, making sure that you discuss with your, with your stakeholders how you want to handle that. All right, well, with that, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Roger, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.